Welcome to Blister's backyard slash playground slash testing area, Mount Crested Butte. Now you may be asking yourself, Luke, how are you gonna test anything? The lifts are done spinning. How are you gonna get to the top? If you did ask yourself that question, good question, because that's exactly what we're talking about today. Today we are going to be skipping the lifts and getting to the top with our own two feet. The original idea for this video actually came about at our annual Blister Summit event, where for a lot of attendees, it's the first time they ever go ski touring or split boarding. And understandably, they have a lot of questions about the very basics of the gear that they're gonna be using. However, we figured there's probably tons of other people with the same exact questions, so that's what we're gonna to cover today. Fortunately, one of those pieces of gear is boots, so let's just get right into it so I can warm up my feet. Now, before we jump right into the gear, I wanna note a few important things about ski touring and the backcountry in general. First and foremost, safety is the most important factor to consider. There's some very important safety gear that we will touch on later, but before we even talk about that, we have to talk about education. If you want to travel in uncontrolled backcountry terrain away from ski resorts like the one behind me, the first step is to get some basic safety training. That typically comes in the form of an Airy One avalanche education course. Avalanches are an extremely real danger in the backcountry, and you need to do the work to prepare yourself before going into avalanche terrain. If you don't know where to start your avalanche education journey, you can reach out to your closest avalanche center or just head to the ARI website. Now that brings us back to where we are right now, a ski resort, not the backcountry, and why. More and more resorts like Crested Butte Mountain Resort are offering the option for people to go uphill during off hours and especially if you're new to the sport, it's a great place to start. Skinning up at a resort allows you to get used to your gear, get used to the physical act of walking uphill with skis on your feet, all in a controlled environment. In theory, if you're skinning in a ski resort in the designated areas, you won't have to worry about the avalanche factor because the resort's ski patrol will have controlled for that before opening that zone. On that note, if you are interested in heading uphill at a resort, first find out if they allow it in the first place, and if they do, look into the details of their specific uphill policy. Lastly, in addition to education, safety gear, and practicing all of that, there's another aspect that none of us at Blister do this sort of thing without, and that is Blister Plus. Blister Plus members get our outstanding injury insurance that covers them for tons of outdoor activities at $25,000 per injury with zero deductible, no network restrictions, and it works anywhere in the world. That injury insurance covers almost all of the most popular outdoor sports, and it's just one of the many benefits of the Blister Plus membership. For that reason and more, we think virtually anyone skiing, snowboarding, mountain biking, or doing any of the other activities should have it. As always, you can head to our site, blisterreview.com, to learn all about it and get yourself signed up, or head to the link in our description. And with that, let's get into some of the basic gear that you need to head uphill. For starters, we've got the skis or the snowboards. And really, that's one of the most basic parts because technically you could put a touring binding on any pair of skis and go skin uphill and ski back down. Generally, a touring or backcountry specific ski is going to be lighter than a ski you'd use in the resort because it feels a lot nicer when you're walking uphill on it. But the downside is typically that it doesn't ski as well when the conditions are a little bit rougher or you're skiing a little bit faster. On the board side of things, you can always just carry a solid regular snowboard, maybe on your back and maybe with the help of snowshoes if the snow is deep. But for the most part, a lot of people use what are called split boards. Split boards, as the name implies, split into two pieces so that you can skin uphill like you're on skis and then at the top, put it back together and ride down like you're on a solid snowboard. On the ski touring binding side of things, they come in a much wider variety, but they all basically allow you to do the same thing. 
In short, they have an uphill mode where your heel is not attached to the ski and it lets you stride uphill. And then they have a downhill mode where your heel is attached to the ski, just like it would be in your regular Alpine bindings. And there are also touring adapters like the Daymaker one that we covered in a previous video that let you convert your resort setup with its Alpine bindings into one that you can take uphill. On the snowboard side of things, uh, splitboard bindings on the way up function a lot like ski touring bindings in that they let your heel lift and let you stride uphill. And then when it's time to head back down, you put your board back together, the bindings lock it together, and then they behave just like a regular snowboard binding. On the boot side of things, there are all sorts of touring specific ski boots. They all have some sort of walk mechanism that frees up range of motion so you can walk kind of like a hiking boot and then you're able to lock it back into a more rigid position for the way down. Now one quick note on compatibility, if your touring bindings use a tech or pin toe for their uphill mode, your touring boots will need a corresponding tech fitting in the boots toe. Things are less niche and specific on the snowboard boot side of things for touring, but there are touring oriented models out there. If you want more details on these general categories of these products, or you want advice on which specific ones to get, you can always head to our website, check out our winter buyer's guide, check out all of our free reviews, or become a Blister Plus member and you can work with our reviewers one-on-one. -on -one. Now, the final thing I wanna go over before we head uphill are climbing skins. And these are basically like carpets that you attach to the bottom of your skis or snowboards. In short, they have a kind of furry side that is slippery in one direction and then grippy in the other. This lets you slide your skis or split board up the snow, and then when you put pressure on it, it grips and lets you walk uphill. On the other side of a skin is a sticky surface, which you use to attach to the base of your ski or snowboard. There's a fair variety of climbing skins out there. We have an article on our website where we compare a bunch of them, but they all accomplish basically the same thing, and that's letting you use your skis or split board to skin uphill. With the core products covered, let's start heading uphill and we'll cover the rest on the way. All right, well, we're gonna take a break here because I have to shed a layer anyways and definitely not because we're trying to beat the sun and I am terribly out of shape. For starters, we need something to put all the other gear in, which is why I pretty much always ski tour with a backpack. You don't technically need anything fancy, but mostly it just needs to be big enough to carry all the gear that you'll have and ideally be comfortable while you're skinning and skiing. If we are heading into the backcountry, I like to have a backpack that has a dedicated pocket for my avalanche safety gear, which we will touch on in a moment, as well as a way to carry my skis on the backpack if we decide to walk up in our boots instead of on our skis. On the apparel side of things, you will quickly realize that any aerobic wintertime activity like ski touring gets pretty complicated when it comes to layers, and layers are definitely key. You'll likely get pretty sweaty while you're walking uphill and working up a sweat, and then you'll probably get cold on the way down. Now, layering for any activity is a whole nother can of worms. So for now, I'll just point you to our Layering 101 article on our website, where we go over the kind of general concepts as well as some specific examples for how we layer for resort skiing or ski touring. So check that out for now. That said, if you are interested in a standalone video on layering, definitely let us know in the comments and we could do that in the future. Now, in addition to all of my layers, I'll also bring a helmet, probably another beanie, one or two pair of gloves, and some goggles or a pair of sunglasses. The rest of my pack is typically filled with lots of water, some snacks, a first aid kit, a small repair kit for any potential problems that might arise, and basically all the other bits and bobs that I would carry for any other outdoor activity. Now, as with skiing in the resort, I always ski with poles and you definitely don't need backcountry specific poles to do this. I happen to use these poles for both, but there are some backcountry specific options out there. Specifically, you might want to use a pair of adjustable poles, especially if you end up doing a lot of side hilling, since you'd have a shorter pole on your uphill side and a longer pole on the downhill side. And then if you're a split boarder, you almost definitely want a pair of collapsible poles since you'll use them while you're skidding uphill, but then you'll wanna be able to pack them down and put them inside or on top of your backpack for the descent. Now, 
as I've alluded to a few times already, in addition to all of the basic gear we've already talked about, there are several very important pieces of safety gear that you need to have if you're heading out into uncontrolled backcountry terrain. If I am heading into the backcountry, I will be triple checking that I have my beacon, my probe, and my shovel, and they're all working properly before I ever leave the trailhead. So to start, an avalanche transceiver, or more commonly called a beacon because it's easier to say, is something that you would use to locate someone if they'd been buried in an avalanche. During your ARI-1 course, you will work with the instructor to learn how to use one of these in addition to all the other safety gear. And just as important as having one is practicing with it and making sure that you know how to use it. Next up, we've got a probe, which is essentially just a collapsible pole that you would use once you've located the general location of someone with your transceiver, you'd use the probe to find their exact location under the snow. Lastly, we've got our avalanche shovel, which you would use to dig the person out once you've located them with your transceiver and your probe. In addition to emergency rescue situations, you'll also use the shovel to dig pits to learn more about what the snowpack is like in your location. And again, you would learn all about that in your Airy One course. Again, these are just the basics and having this gear and knowing what it is, is very different than knowing how to use it. So again, take an avalanche education course, practice with your gear, connect with people who have experience in the backcountry before heading out there yourself. All right, well, we have made it to our transition spot. So next step is to change all of our gear back into ski mode and head downhill. All right, well, we hope this video helped add some clarity to the basics of ski touring and backcountry gear. If you enjoyed it, give it a like. If you have thoughts on future videos we should make, let us know in the comments. And if you wanna catch more of them, then subscribe to our channel. In the meantime, we'll see you later.